The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. I want to tackle another interesting and rather confounding issue in relation to the space and social content of cities. And that has to do with the fact that Not all people in society agree with the ideology that the city maintains for the moment or the society maintains for the moment. To change the world is an ambition of many people or groups of people who believe that they can artificially create environments which are of higher order of goodness than the environment with which they now are presented. Often these situations come about as a, re negative, uh, as a reaction to something negative about the existing city. We will go through a number of these uh, obviously, this is a very large subject again and needs only for me to make a few arguments about it rather than ending with the complete bibliographic explanation of all of the attempts to identify the intentional communities within the metropolitan area of cities or isolated from them. The word utopia has a double meaning. In Greek, e utopia means no place. Utopia means that you, the single you, is a good place. Already the double Greek word meaning indicates some characteristics of which we have to deal with. The created environment in these cases are meant to create a good world. But they also are isolated. So the word is first used in English by Sir Thomas More's book in 1516, where he describes a utopian island. It's an island, which already indicates that it's separate from other existing phenomena, physical phenomena. Secondly, it has 58 spacious and splendid cities on the island. The island is 200 miles long. There's equity of property. Never the houses are never locked as no pri private possessions are tolerated. The owners change every 10 years and are selected by drawing lots. So already you find in the first of the utopian novel explanations or exercises an association with equity, that this is a place where private property is not significant. Uh, there's a random distribution statistically made available through the drawing of lots. So many of these themes involving a boundary condition, involving the distribution of resources, involving the maintenance of the society are characteristics of these ideal communities. You 
more rights of the ideal state or about the new island of nowhere. There's a notion that this environment can, can exist in a sense nowhere, which means that he doesn't touch another environment. There's an interesting linkage of people during this time. For instance, looking backward, the great book by Edward Bellamy in the 1850s, in uh, describing Boston as a communist city, a mechanically controlled communist city in which a man falls asleep and wakes up 100 years later and, in, and sees Boston transformed. Mechanism is an important attribute of that uh, changed environment. And um, so compelling was the book that it sold, it sold millions of copies here in the United States. It was a bestseller. It was read by a man called William Morris in England. William Morris was a great pre-Raphaelite founder of the Socialist League in England, a man of enormous significance who wrote a book called News From Nowhere, completely an uh, uh, antithetical to the concentrated vision of Bellamy. For him, a decentralist solution which abdicated the role of cities was the option. So here, at the same time, you have two 19th century figures in, not in contact with each other, but their works are in contact with each other. The one comments on the others by writing a book. News from Nowhere also refers to Samuel Butler's book, Erewhon. And Erewhon is an anagram of nowhere. I'm just trying to indicate to you the density of interest in this phenomenon. Um, the 19th century was, which is our focus, is the century of great expectations. Much though enormous problems were manifest, there was a sense that given the right kind of conditions, solutions would be found. Great Expectations is again a novel by whom? Who? Dickens, Charles Dickens. It's his 13th novel. What happens in Great Expectations? A young orphan by the name of Pip encounters, wanders in a field and encounters an escaped convict. His life is then dis is the subject of this book. It's a book about how you can, as an orphan, encounter an escaped convict and still make a success of things. Many of these utopias are subject to the creation of new models of social relationship as antithetical to what exists. If the family is weak, the kibbutz takes children and separates them from their families and rears them separately. So does a Robert Owens Institute for the Promotion of Social Character in New, in New Lanark, Scotland. So does the French utopianist Gaudin in Guise. All of these places have environments where children can be grow up independent of the family. The notion of in loco parentis is established to provide rights for people who look after uh, uh, children separate from their family. If the society exhibits Great Puritanism, as Victorian society did, Charles Fourier builds 
his utopian project, the philanthropy, on the notion of passion, sexual passion. Humphrey Noyes in this United States says, a person is somebody to be hugged. And creating only the town of Anida in New York State. If drink and alienation and drugs are the problem, Owen's Reform of Character, Institute for the Reform of Character in New Lanark, uh, Pullman explicitly says, I will not allow my workers to own houses because that will mean they will become separate and want to live a independent life. I want them to behave according to the rules which I set. This is paternalism which of course resulted in complete decay of the community. If the world of the outside, if the outside world is is a new secular world changing very rapidly. The response of the Shakers is to create a religion which remains absolute. No sexual intercourse is allowed in Shakerdom, which creates a fundamental problem of population increase. So it has to convert people. The notion of converting people to because you have a truth is fundamental to certain religions today. I dislike the idea intensely, but that's a personal dislike. So I should dislike Mormonism, which believes in one good thing about the Jews is they don't sell their religion. Well, they may do it in subtle ways, but uh, they don't uh, missionarize. Missionarism is an interesting phenomenon, but it's only the result of a belief in absolute truth. If industrial chaos is what we encounter in the existing world, you'll find the paternal order of factory towns be, a, be, the, be, the, be the factory town of Pullman outside Chicago, south of Chicago, Port Sunlight, the factory town of the Lever Brothers in England, Bourneville, the, Cad the factory town of the Cadbury family, and so on. If you believe the result of the chaos is centralized order or disorder, you opt for options for decentralization. William Morris believes that mom, that over time, Manchester and London would disappear and be replaced by a small-scale, self-supporting, landscaped environment, which uh, I'll detail a little later in the class. Or you believe in the work of Peter Kropotkin, the first urban geographer, the Russian prince who disagreed with Marx about the new state, arguing that a centralized state is likely to fail in favor of a decentralized order. He argued that even in, in during his stay in England, I can't remember the date, the end of the 19th century, he said that the 80% of the factories only employed 8 to 10 people. He was enormously impressed by the Hura region of Switzerland, J-U-R-A, which is the home environment of Le Corbusier, by the way. What impresses Kropotkin is the capacity of watchmaking to organize itself so that there are many enterprises, all small, all competitive, all producing good products. So his reference to industrial chaos is a, is, is agglomeration, and he de disputes agglomeration economics as fundamental to the production of first-class industrial products. That's just a list of the antidotes and the
I'm just going to go through very briefly some more characteristics of these places. There's often an authoritarian order socially, but they're economically democratic. The authority is necessary to maintain attention and to distract from the attraction of the outside world. There's no question of choice here. If choice is economic, well, that's okay. But if it's social, it's dangerous. If the, these projects all have boundary problems. They need to be separate, but they can't exist separately. The, the shakers need new inputs of population. They, they often need, many of them, agricultural and in, industrial businesses, which has the economic base, and they need markets. So you can't eat your own food and maintain yourself totally. There needs to be some interchange producing income. You get what these places don't locate in the wilderness but they could locate in the middle landscape, which Frank Lloyd Wright understands very well. His notion of Usonianism is really a way of dealing with the middle landscape. He built six, 15 houses in Oak Park and the Unity Church uh, in this middle landscape. I'll deal with Broadacre City but later on when we're dealing with Wright himself. The difficulty about how to be yourself and yet be a part of a group, how to change and yet to remain the same. Many of the critics of these intentional communities uh, talk about how rigid, fixed, without much process, they are wooden, mechanical, contrived, inanimate. I visited a drug rehabilitation commune north of San Francisco called Synanon. Synanon was dealing with heroin, with people fighting heroin addiction. We were met at the airport with people dressed in black leather on black motorcycles and escorted to Synanon. Synanon was headed by a man, a single man, who had a mad impulse that the only way to cure heroin is to be as tough as the, uh, as the drug itself. If he, it was a fascist community, if he decided that you, weren't, you shouldn't have wives, you don't have wives. If you decide that people should one morning he wakes up and says, there'll be no smoking, there'll be no smoking. At the same time, Synanon was, uh, had people in it, drug addicts, who were highly competent people other than their addiction. Lawyers, businessmen who lived in Synanon because of the, the, it was a better option than anywhere else there to live. He organized them so that they made money. They would get up early in the morning and call businesses all over the United States, arguing that the, the Synanon was a charitable organization. They sold pencils with Synanon on the pencil. Um, they were so tough that uh, they they enabled a lawsuit against one of the San Francisco n newspapers for f talking about them. They became so fascist that the lawyer that was employed in Los Angeles to work for the newspaper in the lawsuit discovered a snake in his mailbox one day. The community destroyed itself.
the story here is you have to be very powerful socially in order to maintain the distance between you and the existing environment which you're finding incompatible and dangerous. This is an endless struggle. You can go as far as to make the community as insular as possible. The Shakers control the physical form of the environment absolutely. All meat was cut into square pieces. There were places where you could, only certain places where you could hang your clothes. You weren't allowed to embrace in somebody of the other sex. You weren't allowed to shake hands with a foreigner, a stranger, and so on. Endless Epicurean qualities uh, uh, let me just go on. An interesting way that we're both interested in space and society. We need, this is a good opportunity for us to look at these experiments as dealing with both. The extraordinary thing is that very seldom do both, uh, do change occur on both fronts. There's an enormous physical design conservatism in many of these places. Fourier's phalanstery, in certainly in the versions in which which are propagated, look like Versailles. They are large, palace-like structures. The only in innovation in them is the invention of something called a roue interieur. A roue interieur is a very simple system whereby the staircase in the section of a building is public and open to everybody so that you, the idea of mixing is a public act. The Rue Interieur is, uh, can be found, as we'll see when, after the spring vacation, in many of the Russian propositions from, from 1917 to 32. You'll also find it in Corbusier's Unité de Habitation in the center here where commerce is proposed. Obviously, we belong to the same society of intentional communalists as did Fourier. This notion between there being a fixed quotient for in which you could operate economically, uh, you haven't got money. So how do you invade architecturally? Anida starts in an old building which, for which there's no market. Squatting is part of these communal intentions. Um, we will see some examples in the slides of projects like Fountain Grove in California, which propose building an incredible apparatus of Victorian architecture in order to create, a, to attract a community of, of people. We we'll look at the work of, of a number of these people in the slides. I've chosen three archite architects to include in the, in, the, in the discourse. The three architects are are Tony Garnier, the French utopianist who designed a project called La Cité Industrielle, who really believes that you can take the 
paternalistic factory town and change it through architecture. The second one is Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, by the way, Gagne believes was an anarchist who believed that there would be no law courts nor police necessary in his town. The second case is the case of Frank Lloyd Wright, who really is, whose politics are as loose as his buildings. He designed over 700 buildings, or he built over 700 buildings. So when I say looseness, it means not a necessarily a pejorative, but a description of the range of work that he did. He is a man who in Broadacre City proposes that the American citizen has a right to own five or five automobiles. At the same time, he designed, he projects the My Life Center for Chicago and builds uh, and pr proposes. Um, if he has a political solid philosophy, it's called democracy. He writes a book called The Architecture of Democracy, but he's really a, a, a supporter of variations on the system. Usonia is really a version of the middle landscape in which the American has the right to own a house, have an automobile, but in Broadacre City, he also has helicopters flying over the town in his drawings what that's about. He admires Henry Ford because Henry Ford in Muscle Shoals in Alabama proposes a 75 mile long city uh, which didn't occur because the United States government under Senator Norris proposed in 1933 to do the Tennessee Valley Authority rather than sell the rights to Henry Ford. Henry Ford almost ran for as president of the United, for the presidency of the United States as a result. Um, again, here is an instinct in right, always to look at the opposite situation. Uh, democracy involves freedom. Freedom can be assumed through the manipulation of agriculture and industry at the same time which is Ford's great mantra. Ford wanted to build a city in which his workers would only work half the day or three quarters of the day and work in their own garden and make food for themselves for the rest of the day. So we can, when we look at Russia between 1970 and 1932, you have the extraordinary opportunity of observing all the energy which transforms spatial propositions and also deals with a completely new social order. Marx, of course, disliked the idea that his thinking was utopian. He said, um, my dialectical studies are based on the reality. I study the stock market news prices in the London Times every morning. I'm dealing with reality, not with utility. He disliked Fourier. He called Fourier's philanthropy a brothel, although Fourier claimed he was a socialist, and so on. Sorry, Anna. Did you say three articles? Yes. I've, got, I've done two. Corbusier is the third. Corbusier is a more, perhaps, complex story. First of all, he's European, like Garnier. Uh, has enormous ambitions. Uh, he, I'm sorry, I haven't got my notes in front of me. We'll get to him in a minute. Uh, but the basic proposition in, f in f Corbusier's case is that the plan is the object of discussion. The plan is either right or not right. In his view, a plan that he makes is the result of enormous social study and enormous physical awareness. And that, once it is right, it doesn't matter what ideology is, it, 
it supports. His first project, he really has three, three theoretical plans. The first, oh, let's leave Corbusier for a while. I'll come back to him in a minute. Have to watch time because there's a lot of stuff. I think I'm going to skip some of these observations. One of the interesting ones is uh, from a student in this class in 1993 who right, writes to me and says, A comment on today's lecture remarks Freud and Utopia dreams. I was reminded of Italo Calvino's book, Invisible Cities, and I quote, with cities it is as with dreams. Everything imaginable can be dreamed, but even the most unexpected dream is a rebus that conceals a desire or, or its reverse of fear. Cities like dreams are made of desires and equally of fears. Even, the, 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 even if the thread of their discourse is secret, their rules absurd, their perspectives deceitful, and everything consumes everybody else. The student says, does that mean the crazier the expressed desire, the greater the perceived fear? Oh, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, it's a very interesting connective idea which Calvino in his brilliance uh, asserts. Um, there's also a, a work which refers to uh, perversion as a form of utopia. In a book called Perversion and Utopia, there's a essential affinity between the utopian and the perverse in so far as both seek to circumvent the reality principle which defines the human condition. Man has always endeavored to go beyond the narrow limits of his uh, condition. Perversion is one of the essential ways and means he applies in order to push forward these frontiers of what is possible and to unsettle reality. These are strange associations with utopianism. They're not explicit. I mean, Fourier's preoccupation with sexuality is not homosexuality, it's not sexuality amongst children, it's not sexuality with animals. So therefore in our code of behavior it's not perverse. It's about as tame as Shakespeare writing about Romeo and Juliet as young people in love with each other. Yet if you argue that if you wish to confront reality you have to go beyond certain boundaries Certainly the rules of, per of what constitutes perversion are there to be broken. I don't know many social attempts to create perverse communities in this sense. Maybe they're not on record because they're hidden like dreams. And uh, the consequence of fear is so great but the notion that you, the more you exaggerate yourself and the, uh, your options, the more you indulge fear because the more the society... It's such a tense argument that I don't know what to say more about it. Utopia has always been a relatively gentle phenomenon. If, we, if society is screwing up, let's get away, make our own little thing, we'll suffer, we'll go to, to we'll, we'll, we'll cut our meat square or we'll go to church every day or we'll do whatever it is, we won't have sex for forever, uh, whatever. I'm talking as if I'm talking about religion. 
there's a certain faith-based notion involved in, I mean, take Etienne Cabet, the man whom I mentioned in relation to, uh, to Ildefonso Cerda in Barcelona. Cabet envisioned an ideal world called Altruria. And like many others, he set out with 89 people, 89 French people, to the United States to build this ideal community. He lay, bought some land in New Orleans, it didn't work. He went northwards to Illinois and found the Mormon community of Nauvoo, which had been, which had been isolated as the Mormons trekked through four cities on their way to Salt Lake City and Brigham Young found the truth. Uh, Cabet died m miserably in Nauvoo. Um, his supporters in Barcelona wrote and said, can we come out? And everything was horrific. They, they couldn't maintain themselves. They didn't understand the United States. The United States was a great place of experimentation. Robert Owen, after making money in Manchester, went to New Lanark in Scotland, then came to the United States and proposed ideal square communities. Uh, there were 41 Fourier communities in the United States, one of which is the most interesting of all. There's a town in Wisconsin called Ripon, near Kenosha, Wisconsin. There was a f Fourier community there uh, which objected to the fact that the United States was slow in dealing with slavery in the 1850s. It said we're going to form a new political party which is going to use its, the premise of freedom it formed a political party. Which one did it form? The Republican Party. The Republican Party in this country was formed in a, in a Fourier sex-free, no, sex-plus environment. The Ripon Society is still one of the arms of the contemporary Republican Party. The United States attracted other Fourier's like Victor Considerant, who built La Réunion, La Réunion in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, in fact, the USA was very much seen as a promised land. Up to the Civil, up to the civil War, there were 130 intentional commu different communities. 1860 to 1960, 200. Post-1960, 2000. Okay. Let's look a bit more carefully at some of these. Any questions? Why do these things fail? Because when you stop here with one man, you've got to stop here with another. Yeah, the Mormons didn't fail. The Mormons haven't failed. So I'm wrong in asserting, I mean, I suppose I shouldn't confer, confuse secular with religious uh, communities. In, in a sense, all religion is a utopia. It promises eschatology, afterlife, which is a utopian notion because nobody has ever, we don't know if anybody's experienced heaven or not. Heaven is an intellectual construct in the youth from the human mind. Uh, and the promise of eschatology, both in all of the major religions, except for Buddhism, 
I don't know what Buddhism promises after death. No Buddhist in the class. No. Um, the uh, let's just talk a little more about some of the uh, some of these propositions. Sorry, why did this uh, utopia fail? Which one? Like these. The question that you asked. You asked why Imagine having a four. Well, first of all, the formula is wrong. The formula is wrong because it doesn't deal with circumstances which promote continu continuity. Cabet bought some land in France from somebody who sold him a piece of land in New Orleans. He didn't know that the, the New Orleans is a has a terrible climate and uh, has animals and all kinds of things. He lands with a bunch of Frenchmen. How the, how the settlers, first settlers in America ever survived, God alone knows. But uh, certainly Cabet then moved to Victor Considerant built the reunion on his wife's money. He exhausted her fortune, and then the place collapsed. Poor man. Uh, my, my question is not, I suppose, why it failed. My question is, what good does it do to us even if it doesn't fail, or even if it fails, sorry. Martin Buber writes about, uh, Victor Hugo writes that utopianism is the truth of tomorrow. That you need in society people who are going to take chances, propose alternatives to reality. Therefore perversion, provided it does not harm anybody, and that's difficult to ascertain, should be an allowable phenomenon such as I've often objected to the Olympic Games not allowing drugs to be taken by athletes because drug taking is a normal human activity. It depends on the severity of the drug, of course, and obviously as a model to young people. Uh, but in a marijuana free society, which is probably not intoxicating enough to cause you physical harm. Uh, the stretching of the boundaries of society are probably an asset. Therefore, I would stop, I would not want to live in a utopian settlement myself because the very impulse that drove that utopia is frustrated once you're in the utopia. You cannot behave differently in a shaker community. You'd be thrown out the first, first day. But if you went and said to Anne Lee, who herself was a, ma a maniac, who'd suffered six, six dead-born children in Manchester, if you knocked on her door in the morning and said, I think we should have scrambled eggs for lunch today, and cut it diagonally. It's just intolerable. It's in fact an antidote to its own phenomenon. In order to survive, you have to behave in a decided way. The political decentralists like William Morrison, Kropotkin, and so on wrongly placed all the blame at the phenomenon of the agglomeration economies of cities. It believed that you could replace the success of the economic and cultural success of cities, now finally celebrated by the whole world. You must remember that it's only in recent times that when I studied city planning for the first time, it, cities were sort of a, uh, a strange sort of curious phenomenon which people some someday may be interested in. 
the first book in English on the condition of the third world city was written at MIT as late as 1959. William, uh, what's man's search for shelter in an urbanizing world. Uh, a man who'd worked in India decided to gen maybe this is a, are some gen important generalizations about the third world city as opposed to the European American city. So the phenomenon of urbanism and its intellectual equipment is relatively recent and uh, talking about a hundred years, hundred and fifty years ago is, is uh, not to be taken li literally in relation today. For instance, Morris, uh, uh, I don't know where it is. Yeah. And the same with uh, Kropotkin. Rop Kropotkin envisaged, as did the first urbanist proponents of the Russian, after the Russian Revolution, of the power of electricity and the electrical grid, the disurbanist movement in Russia, which we'll deal with after the spring vacation, was fundamentally based on the fact that you now had a power grid system which expanded the possibility of location in fundamentally different ways. Of course, it had other problems. Um, I don't know what to go into. Let's talk a little bit about the architects, seeing this is a class which deals with architecture as well as with society. Tony Garnier's in industrial city, which he proposed as a Rome scholar at the French Academy in Rome, he tried to get the Rome Prize for something like eight times. Finally, they gave it to him. And they asked, when he came to Rome, they he had to they, he had to study a Roman town Tusculum. Um, he confounded them all by making drawings of a new industrial city. The conservatism of the French Academy wouldn't allow him to continue the work, but he did. When I was a Rome scholar myself, in and I arrived in Rome, I went to a part to a reception at the French Academy in honor of Tony Garni, which is again an interesting paradox that they would celebrate the man 100 years after his life. Um, Garni was a superb draftsman and believed in architectural form. For him, what was wrong with the works in, a, in Pullman, Illinois, or in Bournesville, or Port Lever and so on. The town was always, as, as you'll see in the slides, divided into the residential zone where the workers lived and the works. The works was where the industrial production took place. Tony Garnier embellished the, and he did these extraordinary drawings of the works. The works would be built of concrete. They would be wonderful in a wonderfully built environment. He said, all my buildings will have round corners. The concrete will, they'll all be built of concrete, which is a new ingredient, a uh, new structural ingredient. And all the corners would be rounded off. Instead of the residential quarters of Pullman, Illinois, where people couldn't own their houses, he made, and you will see the illustrations, made landscaped environments for houses. He's got interiors which look like Roman cast, not compounds. What's a Roman house called? I forget. 
is a Roman word for the house. It's not mensa. It's uh, whatever. Who speaks Roman? <laughs> Latin, anyway. It's Latin for a house. Casa, probably. Probably casa. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright cites Henry George quite frequently. I've mentioned Henry George's name in passing in this class. Uh, Henry George was an American, I don't know what, economist, I suppose. What would you say Henry George was? An economist? A land economist who ultimately believed that land had no value other than what people attributed to it through use, that land itself was only useful for agriculture. Land itself had no value. It's what human beings did with it that promoted its value. And therefore, he said, he concocted the notion that Henry Stein and Clarence Wright used in Radburn and Sunnyside Gardens is that the, imp the increase in value of land is the result of community's action, not of an individual's action. And therefore, the, uh, the agglomeration of value in land should be assigned and, and assigned to the members of the community, not to an individual. In that sense, if you want to use the contemporary Republican Party definition of socialism, it's probably socialism. But Henry George was hardly a socialist. Frank Lloyd Wright was such a hungry person that he would imbibe anything that came along and justify it by virtue of its apparent truth. <coughs> Corbusier had a different kind of philosophy. I'll show you some of his early sketches in which he would almost make scientific diagrams of the, the three human establishments. He would diagram the which the three human establishments are. He would make a section through a building showing the sun. He'd do a, gra uh, a vector of the sun and the day in time. He would, est in his section, he would establish that the top of a building has relationships to the sun and to heliotherapy. Garnier put his town in the southeast of France up against a hill. On the top of the hill, he puts the institution of heliotherapy. Why the French are so interested in being healthy because of the sun, I don't know. But it's a tradition of apparent human, human hygiene and human uh, health. Um, Corbusier also proposes the lifting up of the city off the ground about 15 meters. Uh, this is to create a landscape of greenery. Um, again, the Europeans always assume that big moves in cities are made by the state. Somehow, for him, the city would be made this way by a new state, by a state <coughs> which would exist independent of its ideology. The first Corbusian plan is for a city of three million people, la ville called Temperaine. Here, the capitalists are, uh, occupy the center of the city, and the workers drift out, out to the outskirts. This, nobody wants to build this. His second plan, the Plan Voisin, which is a plan for part of Paris, which removes the existing diagonal system of Paris and replaces it with a set of teeth. Dans. Those are orthogonally shaped, 
continuous building environment. Um, his third plan, when he's asked by the Russians after 1917 to come to Moscow and do a plan, is a linear system of linear, much like the Mars plan for London, uh, in which he puts housing in the center and uh, that is to appeal to the new Marxism. He's asked by the mayor of Algiers to come to make a plan for Algiers. The story of Corbusier and Algiers is worth an afternoon's discussion. Uh, Corbusier makes a whole set of plans over a number of years. They are called the Obus plans. Amongst his most famous is Obus A, which has an elevated highway system running the coast with housing underneath it. This is the first attempt to build housing in modern times under a transportation system turns out to be very difficult to do, the amount of noxious material that automobiles give off are not certainly something you want to live underneath. Um, however, he makes plans like that for Rio de Janeiro and S Sao Paulo, all dream plans. Um, so angry is he with the uh, response from Algiers, by the way, he, 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 in his plan, removes the Quartier de la Marine where the Battle of Algiers was fought, the great movie, uh, 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 and builds the two towers facing France, maintaining that col colonial relationship between Algiers and France, which Algerians hate. Uh, um, he's so angry that he writes a letter to Mussolini to help him. The French government is the, at this time in a pro-Nazi mood, the Vichy government, Marshal Patin. They appoint Corbusier as the director of the, some kind of thing of government. He writes to Marshal Vergin, says, please help me tell these Algerians that they need to behave. So he ends up writing to the fascists for help. He goes through from capitalism to Marxism to fascism, like playing the piano to see who can, just, who can succumb to the right note. For him, the built plan is a, he says it over and over again. He wrote thousands and thousands of words in his life amongst all these buildings. Um, why don't we look at some of these illustrations? What has happened to the commune movement? Would it always exist and flourish depending on time? The larger question is how propositions about alternatives are massaged within society, are, are honed within society. What we have become fascinated with the word innovation. What constitutes in a social innovation? Same sex marriage laws. Certainly, that's an innovation of a kind. Even in Argentina, it's approved. Our great new pope, I don't know if the story is appropriate, but our great new pope, when he was cardinal, ran a vigorous campaign against social same sex marriage by the wife of the pre previous president. Um, horrific story. Anyway, Catholicism is a utopian venture in a certain sense. It prescribes a truth different from other truths. It doesn't abide 
by movements in reality such as contraception and limited population and so on and so on. Um, so we have powerful utopian forces in modern society who've engaged in great wealth and great power and uh, contradict other utopian ventures as best they can in a power game. It's too complicated to make sense of it. I want to make sense of it a bit better in the second half of this class where we deal with contemporary urbanism. So Thomas More on the left, he's 200 mile island. It's amazing that th the first notion, described notion of utopia in the six early 16th century should advocate social equity. He was an interesting man, Sir Thomas More. So Rob Robert Owen, the young British philanthropist, who after the experiment in New Lanark came to the United States. The crisis or the change from error and misery to truth and happiness. Wow. <laughs> truth and happiness in the United States is living in an enclosed castle uh, with gates these communities would be dotted on the Midwest, um, much like Broadacre City. Next. There you can see one of them on the left. On the right is the best image I could find of the decentralist version. The city is, the big city is gone. Here is an environment, a non-polluting environment. The landscape is vital and indulges farming and landscape for beauty's sake. There's a river, there's traditional methods of power, there are new methods of power. There's a windmill on the top, on the hill on the right. This is the antidote to London. This is William Morris's version of what the world would be like if you could substitute London for it. A bad choice, I believe. Next. Victor Considerant and Charles Fourier's Philanstery. An extraordinary sensibility that this is using the same architectural forms as used in under the auspices of royalty. What is it about behaving differently that you that will succeed if you put it into a palace? There's something about this dream and fear story. If I dream too much, I need to supply myself with nourishment, security. And maybe architecture of a certain kind produces kind of security when you dream too far. Next. Rue Interieur on the left. Pretty modest invention. God learns why you'd make so much fuss about it. And this on the right is the interior of uh, a version of uh, the philanthropy called the Familistry by Go Charles Gaudin uh, next at Guise in France. Next. And this preoccupation with the, with the, in the establishment of the child's world as outside of the family. These are children in Robert Owen and in Guise uh, being looked after by not the parents but by trained 
educated. Uh, there's something about the next generation of people being uncontaminated by the effect of their parents. The kibbutz movement in Israel was went through great crisis around the extremes of this uh, attention to the education of children. Next. The one environment which maintains the physical form as an absolute is the Shaker movement. This is a Shaker settlement in Hancock, Massachusetts. On the right are just indications of the precision of the environment. There's no doubt as to where you hang your hat. Now, everybody will wear the same hat. Everybody will wear the same clothes. A broom will hang in the right position next to a door. Next. The American scene of Humphrey Noyes and his Anida community also based on some version of sexuality. The Rappites, the Bethel Rappites, the great movement across this country, the Mormons, next. The Mormon spatial program, they lay out of one square mile of territory. The houses will be built of stone and brick according to the choice of the owner, but the layout Altern alternates the direction of the plot line horizontally or vertically. There's some theory about that which I don't quite understand myself. Can you imagine wh why it would be better to have houses facing the side of other houses? I, I don't know quite. I've never quite figured this out. But then I'm not a great reader of Mormonism. A more communal activity in California, a theosophist community acting out Aeschylus in a, as a part of the Greeks tragedy, a kind of freer version of the Mormon program. Next. Fountain Grove. <laughs> How can I explain this? I can't, it's just wonderful. It's just a drawing for a developer's idea of what would attract people if they came to live in a different environment. Unique versus replicable plans is the text underneath. All of the feast. I could live here, I suppose, <laughs> if nobody else was there, <laughs> I, if I had the whole thing. I'd have my own religion. Next. <laughs> Next, please. Another Lana del Rio, uh, an intentional community. I think one should look at Drop City rather than these. Drop City, which is somewhere between the counterculture of California and cyber culture of the internet uh, is perhaps more interesting to look at than these. Next. Now, the industrial town. Cronenberg, the Krupp family, and uh, Titus Salt, Sir Titus Salt. Saltaire uh, on the right. Distinguishing between the works and the housing has two separate components of this. Not making use of the river as a great amenity uh, on the left. Titus Salt bought the Crystal Palace 
Yeah, but it burnt down. Next. Port Sunlight by the Lever Brothers. Uh, uh, taking some of the garden city ideas of landscaping, this looks and feels like a different kind of world than the world of Pullman. Next. And a number of strange examples. That's Happy Colony on the left by a man called Pemberton in New Zealand, in which the center of the uh, environment would be farm, model farms, and there'd be four cottages surrounding them. God alone is what the world of cottages and model farms has to do with reality, but still. Here's another version on the right. I think it's in Brazil, much from the 1970s. It has a model farm in the center, and then housing just distributes itself outwards. What is interesting is the variation from, of the circular system from the pervasive grid shown outside. Uh, what is it about a model farm which centers a good environment? I suppose it's basically from an agricultural world. Next. You see the town of Nachalal on the left by the architect Richard Kaufman, 1924, I think, where again there's a central, a central impulse to create a central proposition and radiating out from it. It's almost as if the center is inviolate. The center has to be held. What's the poem by Yeats? The center holds true. Some of you should know poetry. <laughs> Yeats is a great poet. The world falls apart, the center holds, but the something distributes. Anyway, this is almost a primeval preoccupation with centeredness. We remember Mercier Liade's phenomenon of the center in the pre-modern or in the archaic environment. Here's a project by the French group called Commonaut. Again, the center is what is the most valuable preoccupation. What happens around the center just drifts off. Now, Halal does the same. Next. This is Tony Garnier. Look at the extraordinary depiction of the works. The works is almost more beautiful than the housing. The river is maintained as an important production source. The ships are managed within the realm of architecture. Uh, the, the works are all along the river. The, on the upper left is the housing, the linear housing. The hill which is behind the housing has the heliotherapy center in it and the communal facilities are in the black on the right. Next. The heliotherapy center on the right, on the left the communal auditorium, all shaped according to a particular concrete architecture. Next. The house, the housing environment. This is such a far reach from Lever or Pullman or Krupp or uh, people of that kind. This is almost the interior of a Roman casa. The workers, this Reynolds automobile factory worker's wife is seen doing a toilet in this extraordinary environment. Of course, these are dreams. Next. Oak Park, Frank Lloyd Wright's middle landscape, 
He built 15 houses there and the Unity Church, one of his great buildings. Here is Broadacre, the plan of Broadacre City, Broadacre City, which is a very small piece of the built environment. Uh, I think its population is something like 25,000, if that. Here are the students at Taliyez and uh, West are looking at the project in Arizona. Next. The plan is a rather simple plan, an auditorium and cultural facilities, uh, uh, a kind of environment which, uh, in which the landscape is a very important feature. There are lots of facilities such as open-air stores for selling goods. Uh, the automobile population is not fixed, but everybody wants an automobile, can have one. This per peculiar perspective on the right indicates some kind of alternative motion movement system. Uh, uh, the technology of the automobile has suddenly changed, or it looks as if it's changed, it looks as if it's got telephone dialing, uh, circular systems on the automobile, and up in the air a sort of strange piece of technology. Next. Right at the mean, at the same time, was indulging his fantasies on the left in a project for nine, I can't remember the date, uh, probably after the Depression years, the new Chicago Life Assurance, National Life Assurance Corporation, and his very small tower in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, for the Price family, um, where, as I said in a previous class, we have the first attempt in modern times, I think, to put offices and housing on the same floor in a building. Next. Corbusier was so authoritarian in his, in his ambit of knowledge that he could depict the great human establishments uh, La Ville, Tentuculaire, the linear city, the agricultural community, the, the journey of the sun for 24 hours. Next. In the drawing on the section on the left, you have some of the key elements of his building and also urbanism. The high, the sun on the roof, the roof is given to cult, physical culture. The center of the building is given to the rue interieur, taken literally from Fourier, but with no sexuality given. And Logi, um, the building itself lifted off the ground with a vigorous landscape, the sport, and there's a, one of his great buildings in Algiers, the Uwid Achaya building, where there's a semblance to the system on the left. Next. The first plan, the plan for three million inhabitants, the center of which would be the office environment for the capitalists. They primitive ideas about vehicular transportation, but still, it was before the Merritt Parkway was ever built. Never. Next. The Voisin plan, just allocating his nausea for the 19th century street. This is an absolute renunciation of what we call the DNA of Paris. Logier said, 
of making a city, make it like a forest. There's something intrinsic in the diagonals to which our friend Hartzman, of course, understood. Corbusier introduces a new form of housing, a new control of the ground. Who controls all the open space that is left? These great parks. Who maintains them? Uh, is there any question that this is an imposition which is tested on any grounds amongst the people who are going to live there? This is utopian in the sense that it's an, a free interpretation of an alternative, next, without test. He was interested in the machine and its capacity for creating linearity. This is not Henry Ford's uh, system of production, but a system of communication. On the lower slide on the left is his proposition for uh, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, he made a similar proposition along the water. Well, not Sao Paulo is not on the water. Uh, sorry, this, this is Buenos Aires, I think. I can't remember everything. Pity. Um, on the right, he's worked with the Ascoral group, connecting all of Europe linearly. Next. His Algiers proposal, the Quartier de Marine on the right slide is replaced by two towers facing France. Uh, the idea of inhabiting the space under an, uh, What's going to happen to all of the elevated highways in the world? Just about done. Okay, next. You can answer, answer the question after the spring break when you've had time to think about it. <laughs>